And now we will pass go to the next lecture, second lecture. Molecular self-assembly for drug delivery and nanoscale characterization. The lecture will be delivered by Dr. Amira Sedon from the University of Bristol, United Kingdom. So you uh, welcome to, to the Technical University of Bogota. You uh, arrived yesterday. Yes. Okay. So uh, 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 we wish you uh, a good stay in the Moldova. Uh, I hope that you are for the first time. I hope that you will enjoy Moldova. You see, uh, the students are very interested. Uh, and so uh, we will uh, give you the floor to, uh, to deliver your points. So good luck. Thank you. So, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very, very much for uh, the opportunity to uh, speak to all of you um, at this summer school. It's very exciting for me to be in Moldova for the first time. And I'm really enjoying myself so far, and I've been looked after very well, which is great. Um, the second thing I want to do is just introduce myself. So um, I'm Dr. Anna Sutton, and I'm an Associate Professor of Physics at the University of Bristol. But I'm also the Director of something called the Bristol Centre for Functional Nanomaterials. So this is our graduate training centre, which is quite similar actually to the kind of ethos of this programme that you're registered on, which is we take students from a really broad range of backgrounds chemistry, physics, engineering, biomedical science, and we try and train them in the use of nanomaterials and nanotechnology for lots of different applications. So what I'm going to present to you today is um, very similar to some of the things that I present to some of our students when we're trying to get them to think about nanomaterials and nanoscience. And also the work I'm going to present today is very relevant to what my research group do. So my research group are interested in self-assembled nanostructures. So we're interested in this idea of what happens if you take individual molecules, and drop them into, for, for example, a solution, what kind of structures can we actually adopt? So what I'd like to try and cover today is the structure of the cell membrane. Now, I'm using this for two reasons. One of the reasons is, if you're interested in any kind of drug delivery, you need to think about how a material is going to cross the cell membrane to get into the cell to do whatever it needs to do. And the second thing is that the molecules that make up the cell membrane, the lipid molecules, are actually a very good model for self-assembly. So they tell us a lot about how things can assemble on their own. So we're going to start with structure of the cell membrane, lipid structure and function, and then something about the mechanics of how lipids self-assemble. Then I'm going to go on to how do molecules interact with the cell membrane. But then we're going to move into some more application-driven uh, examples of where lipids themselves, these molecules that make the cell membrane, are actually used as nanoscale <coughs> drug delivery vectors. So you can actually package a drug up in a lipid uh, system and you can actually deliver it. And I'll give you some examples of how and why we might do that. I'm going to start with a quick overview. I like to give you a quick overview of what I expect you to know by the end of this, just so you can refer back to it. So hopefully you'll know the type of materials which make up the real cell membrane and some model cell membranes, understand how self-assembly occurs, understands how molecules can interact with cells, know a little bit about what techniques are available to measure these interactions. Now my group uh, spent a lot of time on these techniques, this is what we do. Unfortunately, due to the uh, limitations on my time here, I can't go into a lot of detail about these techniques. But one thing I would like to offer you is if any techniques that during your time here become relevant to you and you don't know how to access them or you want to talk more about them, you can always have my email address and you can send me an email and maybe I can uh, invite you over to my lab to, to actually make some of these measurements yourselves. Okay? So if it's something that becomes interesting in the future, just let me know. And then finally, be aware of the uses of things like model lipid systems in drug delivery and how these might actually make some new types of uh, cancer treatments. So, why am I covering this? So this is the beginning. Lipid self-assemble. 
Okay, so they're important in biology, but they're important as a nanomaterial. And what we learn today can be applied across lots of different materials. Interactions of nanomaterials with the cell is crucial in understanding nanoscale drug delivery and how nanoparticles or nanosystems are going to reach a target. And we also need, it's really important in all research, to know some of the limitations. Okay, what can't they do? What are they not going to be able to achieve? So we're going to start with an overview of the cell membrane. Now, to some of you, this might be quite familiar. To others of you, you might not have been seeing this before. So the cell membrane is basically... Oh dear, it's not showing everywhere. The cell membrane is the layer that keeps the inside of the cell in and the outside of the cell out. You can think of a cell as being a bit like a bag. Now, a bag is only useful if it's got an inside and an outside. Okay, you need things on the inside kept apart from things on the outside. And so if the cell is like a bag, we've got an interior, which is full of uh, an aqueous solution. Okay, so it's an aqueous interior. But the exterior of the cell up here, this is also aqueous. So what we need is a way of keeping the aqueous interior separate from the aqueous exterior. And that's achieved by this cell membrane here. And the way it does it is by self-assembly. So what we have here is a five nanometer thick bilayer structure, which is made of molecules called lipids. And the lipids, we'll see later, have three very important parts to them. They have a head group, which is hydrophilic. They have a linker, which joins the head group to the tail, which is hydrophobic. And so by putting the tails back to back here, what I do effectively is I create a hydrophobic sheet, which has a hydrophilic head group on the top, which points towards the outside of the cell, to the aqueous part on the top, and a hydrophilic group on the inside, which, before, which points towards the aqueous part inside the cell. So I've got aqueous here, aqueous up here, and I have a hydrophobic core in the middle, which basically keeps the two separate. And so this bilayer structure here is the thing that gives all of your cells their ability to be a cell effectively. Now, like a bag, uh, a bag's only useful if you can take things out and put things in when you need. If the bag was closed all the time, you wouldn't be able to put anything in or take anything out. If it was open all the time, everything would fall out. And so what we find in the cell is that we have these membrane proteins here. So we have these protein molecules that sit across the membrane. And these proteins are quite special. They're very, very hydrophobic because they have to sit through this hydrophobic core here. And what these do is these control the passage of nutrients into the cell, they control the passage of toxins out of the cell, and they also control the transduction of signals across the membrane. And we're going to see later on that if you want to get something into the cell, like a drug or a nanoparticle, you need to know a bit about this membrane layer, but you also need to know a little bit about these proteins as well, and this is quite a lot of what my group work on. So uh, we're basically dealing with this five nanometer thick layer, which is going to keep everything um, basically separate inside the cell. And the molecules that make up the cell, uh, the cell membrane, are called lipids. And this is a kind of general idea of what a lipid looks like, okay? And we're going to deal with a class of lipids called phospholipids. And they're called a phospholipid because basically, we'll see in the next couple of slides, they have a phosphate group in them. So what we have here is an individual molecule sitting in the cell membrane. So this is pointing up towards this uh, aqueous extracellular space, and inside is the lumen of the cell. So here's my hydrophilic head group, here's my hydrophobic tail, and here is my linker region. Now, the interesting thing about lipids is that we have a huge number of different head groups and different tails. And so by mixing and matching the head groups and the tails, we can create a very, very complex material of the cell membrane with actually very, very kind of simple changes. And we'll, show, we'll look at some head groups and some tails on the next slide, but actually there are thousands of different combinations. So commonly people sort of, particularly, I'm not trying to do down my biochemistry and molecular biology colleagues here, but they tend to think of the... Uh, membrane as being kind of quite homogeneous and it just sort of sits there and it's, you know, it's not really very interesting. For me, it's actually a very complex nanomaterial. Five nanometers thick with loads of different functionalities in it. So you've got thousands of different possibilities of lipid and how they pack together will determine what kind of structure you get. So the self-assembly of these lipids is really important. 
The presence of every lipid in a real cell membrane is there for a reason. It might be structure. So it might be there to make a particular part of the cell slightly stiffer. It might be there to impart curvature, and we're going to look at curvature later on. Or certain lipids are actually part of signalling pathways, so they're actually there to transduce signals. So the lipids are really important. Also what's interesting is the membrane is asymmetric. So this top layer here that points towards the extracellular space will be different in its lipid composition to a layer that points towards the interior. And this is really important when we start to consider things like apoptosis, when the cell starts to die, the signals are actually produced by the flipping of the interior membrane to the exterior. So the interior and exterior must be different. Okay, and this makes this material unbelievably complex, but also pretty cool. So, I'm going to give you an example of a typical lipid that we might find in a membrane. So this is something called Di18PC. And so this is basically a phosphatidylcholine lipid. So this is the sort of standard membrane lipid that you may come across. In all of our model membranes, nearly all of them are based around this structure. So, some interesting kind of things about the, um, the phos this particular phospholipid here is it's got its hydrophilic head and tail. It's got what we call the choline head group. So this choline head group here, you can see it's got a ternary amine structure here, which has got a positive charge on it. But it's also got a phosphate group here, which has got a negative charge on it. So this molecule contains both a positive and a negative charge on the same molecule. So electrically it's neutral, but we refer to it as a zwitterion. Okay, so it has both positive and negative charge on the same molecule. Now some uh, uh, membrane lipids, as we'll see later, are actually charged. And this is, again, becomes really important. So we've looked at the head group. We've got this phosphate linker here. This is where the phospholipid bit comes from. We've got this phosphate linker here, linking to this glycerol. So, phos um, so this is basically our, our linker. And then we've got the tails. And the tails are hydrophobic, and they're effectively a fatty acid. So they're a long hydrocarbon tail. So just lots and lots of CH2 groups with a CH3 at the end. So these are very, very hydrophobic. And what we find is that some of them are what we call saturated, so they have no double bonds, they're completely full of hydrogen, and some of them are unsaturated, which means they have a double bond, which means they've got a couple of hydrogens missing. And what this means is, where we have a double bond, we change uh, the fluidity of the tails, so we basically find that an unsaturated tail like this is capable of more movement than a saturated tail, so it makes the membrane more like a fluid, but also it changes the angle at which the tail bends. And when we come to look at curvature and structural packing later, this degree of unsaturation here, the number of double bonds and the bending of the tail will actually determine a lot about how the structures form. And the bonds here of the linker and the tail are also really important. So actually, um, these are, for those of you who have a chemistry background, these are ester bonds, so these are SN2 esters. And actually, the interesting thing about these is, it's these bonds that if you get bitten by a snake, the reason that it, it kind of breaks all your cells up and eventually gets all the toxins into your body and will ultimately kill you, is the snake venom contains a chemical, an enzyme, that attacks the linker region in phospholipids. It cuts the tail off and the membrane breaks open. And so it allows uh, the snake venom to get into your cells. And so we can actually use this in the lab to um, create different structures. So we can go in and we can start to cut tails off lipids um, and actually use this as a way of promoting different structures. But this is, just as an interesting aside, this is the reason that the snake venom kills you as it goes in and it destroys your cell membranes because of the breaking of this bond here. So that's the kind of anatomy of what a lipid looks like. So let's look at the composition that we might expect to find. So let's take the head group first. So I said the head groups are hydrophilic. And I showed you at the beginning this phosphatidylcholine uh, head group. So here's my tails, which I've just called R. Here's my linker, this um, phosphate and this glycerol here that links the head to the tail. And at the end here, I've got, oh dear, this is not working real. Um, 
I've got my choline group, so that's that ternary amine, so it's got three CH3 groups. Now, if you're not from a chemistry background, you might think, well, why is that interesting or important? Sorry. The reason is three CH3 groups like this are quite bulky. Okay, it's quite a big molecule. And so what it means is that we've got quite a large head group here. And we'll look later on about what the implications for packing are by having quite a big head group. Now, the best way of working out whether this is a big head group is to compare it to something else. <coughs> so I'm going to compare it to this next one down. And this is the phosphatidyl ethanolamine head group here. So I've got the same R groups. I've got the same glycerol and phosphate group. I've still got a quaternary, I've still got this uh, amine at the end here, but instead of three methyl groups now, I've replaced the methyl groups, the CH3 groups, with hydrogens. So I've made this big bulky head group quite small. So suddenly I've gone from a structure which is really big at the top to a structure that's really small at the top. And as we'll see later on, that drastically changes the behaviour of this particular lipid molecule. And in fact, structurally, this change from a methyl group to a hydrogen is really, really important in a lot of processes. Now, I said these two were zwitterionic, but we also have ones that are charged. So, <coughs> diacylphosphatidyl glycerol here, this has got a glycerol head group which is neutral, but then there's this oxygen here which still carries a negative charge. So, this lipid is now negatively charged. And we find phosphatidyl glycerols quite a lot in bacterial cell membranes. So, you'll find very <coughs> high concentrations of these what we call PG lipids in a bacterial cell membrane. Now that's really good because that means if we've got a different lipid composition and a different charge between a bacteria and say a human cell, we can tell them apart and we might be able to use that as a way of targeting uh, bacterial cells to kill them. Or we also find in cancer cells that can sometimes be very high amounts of these negatively charged lipids. So again, it's a way of telling the cell types apart. Phosphatidyl serine over here, this is a serine head group on the uh, far right hand side. This has got a negative charge on the serine oxygen, but also on the phosphate oxygen. So this is very highly negatively charged. And this is the lipid that flips from the inside to the outside of the cell during cell death. So this is a signaling lipid in its own way. I've included sphingomyelid just as a comparison. The difference here with sphingomyelid <coughs> is that what I have here is instead of this phosphate linker, I have what's called a sphingolinker. Okay, so this changes again the kind of lateral separation of these lipids within the membrane. And you will find sometimes if you ever read about lipids that you read about these sphingolipids. And this is just to give you a comparison of the structure. Head group might be the same, tails might be the same, but the linker is different. And I've included for completeness cholesterol, which is not a lipid, but it is a sterile and it's found in the membrane. Now, cholesterol is quite a flat, two-dimensional structure, and what we find is when we have tails in the membrane, the cholesterol sits vertically in between the tails, and it stops them moving. So cholesterol stiffens membranes up quite significantly, and it makes membranes quite tense. So it is found in high concentrations in certain membranes that need to be quite stiff. So that's to give you an overview of just some of the different types of head groups. There are other ones as well, but these are the major ones. And then let's consider the tails. <coughs> so what I've done is I've kept the head group the same. So I've kept the phosphocholine head group here, the same in all, in all cases, and this same linker. But what I've done is I've changed the tail. And I've only changed the tail very, very subtly. Each of these tails is 18 carbons long. So each of these is a carbon, okay, going along here. I might have to just start going up the pointer. Each of these here is a carbon, okay? And you can see that in the top configuration, I have two 18 carbon tails, and I have a double bond, so I have a lack of hydrogens at the nine position. And this nine cis position means that the hydrogens that I've removed have both been removed from the same side <coughs> of the chain. This makes for quite, quite straight tails. Okay, so these lipid tails will be quite straight. Now if I compare that uh, to the nine, sorry, the nine cis position, they're both on the same side. This makes the tails flip out slightly. So like I showed you on the previous slide uh, with the tails, we have that kind of kink in the tail where the tails will flip out slightly. 
if I take them from opposite sides, the hydrogens from opposite sides in the nine trans position, so this tail is still 18 <coughs> carbons long, it's still got one double bond per tail, what I find now is these tails are really straight in comparison. So simply by flipping the side that I remove the hydrogen from, I've actually ended up with a very, very different tail structure. Now if I go to an extreme case, so something like this bottom one, where I've got a 9 cis and a 12 cis double bond, so I've removed two hydrogens from the cis positions at the ninth carbon, and two hydrogens from the cis position at the 12th carbon, I end up now with a kink in the tail of the ninth carbon and a kink in the tail of the 12th carbon. The upshot of all of this is I'm changing the volume of space that the tail occupies. If the tails are straight, they're not going to take up very much room. If the tails are very, very kind of bent out, they're going to occupy a lot of space. And we'll see when we combine this with the size of the head group that this is going to affect the self-assembly and the packing of the lipid structures, which ultimately is going to change the structure of the membrane. So, um, I thought I'd just put in a little bit about the kind of principles, the first principles of self-assembly. And in order to do this, we have to understand a little bit about the thermodynamics of what's happening. So, there are some definitions that we need to think about. And the first is that for a process, so for any process, and in this case, we're considering self-assembly as our process, for a process to be spontaneous, the quantity known as the Gibbs free energy for that process, which we define as delta G, must be negative. Okay, so it must be less than zero. Uh, for those of you who've never met Gibbs free energy before, it's a very common thermodynamic parameter. So we define it as the maximum reversible work done by a thermodynamic system at constant temperature and pressure. And the interesting bit about it, and the bit that you don't have to be able to kind of prove all of this from first principles, but just kind of be aware of, is it links enthalpy, which is the heat of a process, which is either given out or absorbed during that process, with the entropy or the disorder of the system. Okay, so we have a way here of looking at heat in and heat out and comparing it with disorder. And so the Gibbs free energy equation is given here, which is delta G is equal to delta H, that's our heat component, minus T for temperature, delta S, which is our entropy component. Oh. Now the universe has a tendency to want to increase entropy, everything is moving towards disorder. So self-assembly is increasing order. So self-assembly is actually working against the idea of this increase in entropy. So there has to be something about the process of self-assembly which allows it to happen because on an entropic level, self-assembly shouldn't occur because we're taking a disordered bunch of molecules and we're packing them into an ordered configuration. And it's the Gibbs free energy that tells us why self-assembly happens. So there must be a driving force to form a well-defined structure like a membrane. So a cell membrane wouldn't form unless there was some sort of driving force behind it. And the driving forces in lipids and in all of the kind of small molecule self-assembly I'm going to talk about is the hydrophobic effect at the hydrocarbon water interface. So it's the desire for those hydrophobic tails to be shielded from water that's much more important to the molecule than the fact that it's packing in an ordered structure. And the hydrophilic and electrostatic and hydration forces between head groups. So the fact that the hydrophilic head groups desperately want to point towards water, the hydrophobic tails really don't want to be anywhere near the water, this overcomes this entropic barrier and allows the molecules to self-assemble. There's some really interesting things you can consider, and this is the same for things like proteins, and it's the same for all other amplifier molecules, is there has to be this overwhelming desire for the molecule to want to form a structure, because entropy says it shouldn't. So, let's have a think about why and when self-assembly will occur. So, it occurs when delta G is less than zero or delta S is greater than zero. We're going to just consider it in general terms as the Gibbs free energy being less than zero. Um, so let's think about what that means in terms of the free energy. What we can say is that the free energy G has to have a minimum value with respect to one of these structural parameters. So this idea that there has to be a driving force, there must be a minimum in free energy somewhere for these structures to actually want to come together. 
So we're going to pick a parameter and we're going to define self-assembly based around one parameter. And that parameter is going to be the optimal head group area. So think about our lipid head group. It's going to be the amount of space across the membrane that that head group ta takes up. And we're going to call that A. And G is our basically is our free energy okay, of the system. So we can think about in the membrane what parameters are what forces are occurring between the head groups uh, in the membrane. And what we find is that at the interface here, there's going to be an attraction. And that attraction is driven by the fact that we want to protect these tails from water. Okay, we want to keep everything packed close together because the hydrophobic tails want to be basically kept away from the water. So this attractive interaction, bringing all the lipids together, will decrease the effective head, the optimal head group area. If we pull everything close together, it makes the head group area smaller. Balancing this, we also have a repulsive term. Okay, so if we've got head groups with negative charge on them, like our phosphatid or glycerols, we'll find they'll want to push each other apart. We'll also find that the water that hydrates the hydrophilic head groups is going to need some space. So that's going to push things apart as well. So you're going to have an attractive interaction at the interface, and that's going to reduce the head group area, but you're also going to have a repulsive interaction between the head groups, which is going to increase the head group area. And so the minimum free energy will be the balance between the attraction and the repulsion. And this is the case for all self assembly is we're looking for a balance between attraction and repulsion. We want to get it just right so we can form a structure. So let's think about attraction only. And in fact, attraction only is something that you already know about. If you've got a system where you've got something that's really hydrophobic and you've got water, let's say you're making salad dressing, you've got vinegar and you've got oil. When you put vinegar and oil together, they immediately separate because all of the oil molecules would rather be with the oil molecules and all of the vinegar molecules would rather be with the vinegar molecules. And that's because the oil is strongly attracted to the oil and the vinegar is strongly attracted to the vinegar. So you end up with phase separation. Okay, this is kind of the principles of oil and water. Is they won't mix because they'd rather be with themselves. They'd rather be surrounded by molecules that are like they are. And so in an attraction only situation, if we look at the surface area per molecule and we compare that with the interaction of the interaction energy of the self assembly, what we find is as A decreases, the molecules come together and we end up with this attractive interaction that phase separates everything. So this attractive interaction, as I said before, arises from the interfacial tension at the tail water interface. And if you're interested, the value that we usually quote for this, um, which we, we normally call this parameter gamma, is about uh, 50 millijoules per meter, uh, per meter squared. So this is the kind of uh, strength of the interactions we're looking at here. But if I only had attractive forces in my system, I would simply separate the two components out. Uh, so, sorry, the attractive interfacial free energy contribution overall, therefore, is given by the strength of the interaction multiplied by the, uh, this, this optimal head group area. So we've got a value that we can put into an equation that will give us the uh, strength of the attractive interaction. So let's go to repulsion. So repulsion is the opposite, obviously. So now everything's trying to push each other apart. And again, you've seen systems like this, you know of systems like this. If you put salts into water, the salt ions will try and get as far away from each other as possible because the salts are charged and therefore they want to be as far away in space as they can be from other things that are charged and therefore they disperse. So things that are uh, uniformly dispersed within a solution are usually doing so because they're experiencing entirely repulsive interactions. And so what we're doing is we're basically um, dispersing all of our molecules equally out in solution. So in the case of um, our lipids, uh, and thinking about what this does to our head group area, it turns out that this is actually quite a complex thing to model. So the repulsive contributions that we have within our system are way too complicated to just write down a formula for. There's going to be things from the size of the head groups, there's going to be the hydration force to consider, there's going to be the electrostatic interactions if the head groups are charged, so it makes it very complex. 
But for those of you who've done any sort of um, Van der Waals equations of state as part of a physics program, you can actually kind of use those to give a rough estimate as the, uh, the repulsive contribution. And what we find is it's just proportional to one over the head group area. Okay, so we're going to simplify uh, our repulsive terms to simply one over the head group area. So here we have our repulsive terms, and you can see that um, we're increasing the repulsion as we try and push things together, they want to push apart. So, self-assembly will occur when the balance of attraction and repulsion is just right. So when we've not got things that are trying to phase separate, but they're also not trying to disperse themselves, when we get that just right, we're going to set up a system <coughs> by where self-assembly can occur. So basically, it's the combination on this graph of the repulsive and the attractive interactions and the points where these intersect here, we have a total interaction energy and we can use this, this is our minimum free energy here, this is our minimum free energy, if we draw a line across here, we can calculate at what area of head group this might occur at. So by taking these very simple concepts, we can add them together and have a rough idea of when these, this might occur. So let's put all of that together. So, the total interfacial free energy per molecule in any self-assembled structure, I'm just using liquids as an example, can be written as the interfacial free, the free energy G is gamma A, that's our attractive contribution, plus K, which is a constant, okay, over A, which is our repulsive contribution. We're just using K for now as some sort of proportionality constant. We're going to assume that both the attractive and repulsive forces are acting in the same plane, so they're all acting in this two-dimensional plane at the head, uh, the head tail interface, so just think of our big flat sheet of lipids. Everything's happening in the same plane, we don't need to consider vertical forces, we're just considering the lateral interactions. So we can find the minimum free energy if we just basically uh, set uh, dg over dA to be equal to zero. I'm not expecting anybody to actually kind of go through and analytically prove this, it's just to kind of give you an idea of where it comes from. Therefore, we can actually then have an expression for the minimum free energy in the system, where it, this is equal to two gamma A naught, where this is at our A naught and our optimal head group area, and A naught is the root of K over gamma. So this is the optimal surface area per molecule at the interface. And we can rewrite this interface with free energy now as G is equal to 2 gamma A naught plus gamma over A, A minus A naught all squared. And what this does is gets rid of that K. Okay, we didn't know what K was, but we can define K as we did on the previous slide. So we've been able to define A naught in terms of K. So now we have an equation that gets rid of K, which is unknown, and it gives us the free energy in terms of gamma and A naught both of which we can measure. Okay, So we now have a way of being able to do a measurement and predict whether or not self-assembly can occur. <coughs> so it's this concept of opposing force that leads to this optimal lipid head group area and the total interaction at this optimal head group area, so the amount of space that the lipid is taking up, is reducing this free energy to a minimum. And this is what gets over this entropic barrier is we're balancing these forces out such that we have a minimum in the energy. Okay? And if we get this right, as we obviously do because our cells form, so they must be self-assembling, we can find that actually self-assembly is a spontaneous process. Now, this ignores a lot of specifics. This is a very, very simplified model. The actual kind of realistic models are much more complicated. So it ignores the very specific head group interactions, so it ignores things like hydrogen bonding. It ignores specific chain interactions, and it assumes the system is flat. Okay, so we've been doing everything in a single plane, okay, a two-dimensional sheet. So it ignores the concept of curvature, but I'm going to come on to that in a minute, because actually, by changing some of these parameters, we can induce curvature into our surfaces. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to look at this idea of geometric packing. So we've shown that there is a favoured interaction between lipids that leads to self-assembly. Okay, this balance of attraction and repulsion, if you get it right, you'll get a self-assembled structure. But we don't know what shape it will lead to. We've just assumed so far that all of our self-assembly will lead to a flat lipid sheet, a bit like the cell membrane that I showed you. So now 
the geometry or the packing properties of the individual molecules become important. And we touched on this right at the beginning when I said some head groups are really big, some head groups are quite small, some tails occupy a lot of space, some are quite narrow. So these individual properties are going to become really critical. So what we can do to make things easy for ourselves is each lipid, each self-assembled molecule, we can assign it some parameters and help define its individual shape. Once we've done that, we can pack all the shapes together and see what happens. So we've got the optimal head group area that we've just covered, A0, that's going to be one of our critical parameters. We've got the volume that the tail occupies, so if you imagine taking the tails and just drawing it kind of enveloping them in a kind of a cone or a cylinder, that's our second parameter we can think about. How much space does the tail take up? And also the effective length of the tail, so how long is that hydrocarbon tail? Because I've shown you 18 carbons, but some lipids have tails that are 24 carbons, some are 12, some are 14. This massively changes the way that they'll pack. So, in order to quantify this, we can use something called a packing parameter. And this is a really nice, simple explanation as to what kind of shape we might expect from our self-assembled structure. So to a first approximation, packing parameter P is going to be equal to the tail volume, V, divided by the head group area multiplied by the length. Okay? So by doing this, by working this out, we're going to get a number which is going to help us decide what kind of shape our lipid has. And with lipids, we can categorise roughly into three different types of lipids based on roughly what their packing parameter is likely to be. So in the middle, I have something called a type 0 lipid. So this type 0 lipid here, that's my classic lipid that I showed you, this um, di18PC lipid. Turns out that head group and the tail occupy roughly the same amount of space. So the width of the head group, this area of the head group, and the volume of the tail are roughly the same, which means that it's roughly like a cylinder. Okay? So it's kind of, if you ignore the lid of this and look at it like this, it's kind of not dissimilar to this. Okay? So I've got something that's roughly cylindrical. Now, if I take lots of bottles that are roughly cylindrical, imagine it with them in Coke cans, and I pack them together, they're going to pack in a flat sheet. Okay. There's nothing driving anything, any other structural change. They're all just going to pack nicely next to each other. So cylindrical lipids pack in flat sheets. Let's take the example of the phosphatidyl ethanolamine head group. Remember I took the methyl groups, the big head group, and I turned it into a small head group. So what I've done here is I've made the head group small compared to the volume that the tail takes up. So what I have now is something that is what's called a type 2 lipid, which you can see here. This type 2 lipid has a small head group and a large tail. So you can think of this as like um, a cone with the point at the top. If I take a load of cones, like ice cream cones, but I turn them upside down, and I pack them together, they're not going to pack flat. They're going to pack in this curved structure here. And we define <laughs> this curvature as a negative curvature. So if I have curvature that bends this way, okay, where I've got like a kind of smiley shape, that's negative curvature. In the terms of, of what we're talking about with lipids, this would be curving towards the water. So this is my layer of lipids, they're bending up towards the water. On the opposite side of the membrane, they'd be pointing down towards the water. Okay, so negative curvature is curvature towards the water. Now let's say I took my di18 PC lipid and I attacked it with some snake venom and I took one of the tails off. I would end up with a small volume for my tail but a much bigger head group. And in this case I'd end up with something called a type 1 lipid over here. So big head group, small tail, what I end up now with is the cone with the point at the bottom and the big bit at the top. Again, think of ice cream cones. I've eaten a lot of ice cream since I've got here, so I should have probably brought some with me, so I could have uh, shown it to you. But if you take a bunch of ice cream cones and you hold them together, they'll naturally curve in this direction. And you can see here, now I'm curving away from the water. So this type 1 lipid, where the head group is big and the tail is small, gives you something called positive curvature. So negative curvature on the left here, 
positive curvature on the right and flat structures in the middle. So you can see that just by considering volume, head group and length, we can actually start to describe the types of structures that we're going to get. This is important from a self-assembly perspective if you want to make a material, but also it's actually used in biological systems. So you find if membranes want to bend, so let's say they want to uh, bring something into the cell, you'll find lots of type 2 lipids will crowd at those points to allow the membrane to, build, uh, to, to bend inwards. So actually these structural transformations are biologically really, really important. So, Here's just a bit more detail on the packing parameter. So we can ascertain to our first principle the kind of structure we're going to get, given the geometric constraints of the molecules we're working with. Now, sometimes this is not a unique structure. So what happens is entropy, again, will favour the structure formed from the smallest number of molecules. So the least number of molecules involved will give the unique structure, because this gives the least kind of entropic penalty. So if there's two or three structures you can form, the one that involves the least number of molecules will be the one that forms. And for those of you who are interested in calculating this, you can actually put some various figures on, depending on how many CH3s and CH2s you've got in your tail, you can calculate the volume and the length using some very, very simple relationships. Okay, so it's just an idea if you ever have a molecule and you want to know what it's going to do, you can use this to roughly calculate uh, what you're going to get out. And this works surprisingly well for a simple approximation. It predicts, we've had a few papers on this, with some synthetic molecules, where we can predict um, the structure from the synthesis of the molecule fairly accurately just by being able to do this calculation. So, for any given lipid, the value of the packing parameter will to a first approximation tell you what kind of structure you're going to form. So here's a, a nice figure that I took from a, a book called uh, Molecular and Surface Forces by Jacob Israelak-Villi. If any of you are interested in this, uh, do let me know because I can recommend, highly recommend this book to you. It's a fantastic book. It goes into way more of the math than I'm going to cover. And you can see that a packing parameter of less than a third, you're going to get a micelle. A third to a half, you're going to get like a worm-like micelle, like a rod-like structure. A half to one, you're going to get a bilayer or a vesicle. A planar bilayer is exactly one. This is when we get our perfect cylinder. And anything greater than one, we're going to get an inverse structure. So the tails are going to be on the outside, and the head groups are going to be on the inside. So just by having a rough idea of what the packing parameter is, we can have a really good guess of what our structure is going to be. So each structure is the minimum size aggregate for which all of the lipids have their minimum free energy. So it is the lowest energy structure we can form. So I've showed you a little bit about this lipid packing here. We've got our type 1s, type 2s, and type 3s. No, sorry, type 1s, type 2s, and type 0s. And so you can see that by mixing these together in a membrane, we can have areas which have different curvature in the membrane. So the membrane doesn't have to be just a two-dimensional flat sheet. It can have structure. So we've divided them into categories. I'm going to give you some examples here. So here's my di18PC. My di this is my cylindrical lipid packed into flat bilayers. Here's my type 1. This is a single chain PC. And this is packing into this positive like a micelle structure. And on the other side here, I've got my inverse cones. And these are going to pack into these kind of inverse hexagonal structures here. And so this is kind of a, quite interesting to think that all of these might be present in a membrane at any given time. The head groups of two of them are identical. The tail lengths are all identical, but it's what I've done to things like the number of tails or the size of the head group that massively determines the packing. If I put a load more double bonds in, remember I flip the tails out, I take up more volume. So something with a couple of double bonds in will have a much bigger V, okay? So it will want to spread out a lot more. And so there's a really nice way of synthetically altering the way that we make all of these structures by simply putting in different lipids. So, cell membranes are made up of lots of different types of lipids, going to be type zeros, type ones, type twos. Some of these are inherently not going to want to form flat bilayers. So how can we maintain bilayer integrity if we don't have lipids that want to form flat bilayers? And the way we do that is we take a slice through the bilayer and we sum up all of the forces. So at the top of the head groups there, we've got electrostatic repulsions. It's trying to push everything apart. Within 
the lipids, we're going to have the potential for hydrogen bonding. So these short-range interactions that are going to pull things together. We're going to have van der Waals attractions. So van der Waals attractions that are going to pull things apart. So these are transient dipoles that are pulling everything together. We've got the hydrophobic effect, which we said is really important, which is going to pull everything together to prevent the water getting in. And we're going to have hydration forces pushing everything apart. So if we look through that and we kind of look at what's attracting and what's repelling, what we have to work out is all of the head group pressures and all of the chain group pressures, which are all trying to push it apart, have got to be balanced by the surface tension, which will pull it all together. So the right combination of lipids will have the right parameters to be able to maintain bilayer integrity and bilayer shape. If we get this wrong, we're going to end up with a bilayer that's not going to want to be, uh, not going to want to be flat. So we consider these forces, all of these forces must sum to zero to have a flat, normal, structured bilayer. But this isn't always going to happen in reality. So within a real membrane, you're going to end up with a situation where you're going to have loads of type 2 lipids. Now this might be because you need the membrane to bend a little bit. But if you've got loads of type 2 lipids and they're on either side of the membrane, you're going to end up with a situation like this in the top here where the two sets of tails want to pull apart. Now, unfortunately, this is going to potentially let water in. And of course, that's something that we know that the hydrophobic tails don't want to experience. So the membrane has the ability, to a certain point, to overcome this by clamping itself shut. So it can resist the ability to curve towards the water up to a certain point. And this is fine, but if you can imagine, I've got a sheet that wants to bend this way, I've got a sheet that wants to bend this way, and they are fighting to bend, but I'm fighting to keep them together. You can imagine that the tension, the stress inside that membrane is very, very high. So what I'm going to end up with is a situation where that membrane is desperately trying to flip apart, but I'm holding it together. And actually, there are some proteins that exist entirely to sense this. So there's a protein called CCT, um, which is an enzyme that is a stress sensor. So when a membrane ends up in this stress situation, CCT comes along and it binds, and it synthesizes lots of type 1 lipids. Remember, type 1 lipids have positive curvature. So it overcomes this bending towards the water by popping in lots and lots of nice relaxed lipids, and to the point where the membrane becomes so relaxed, the CCT falls off and the synthesis stops. And so we have inbuilt stress sensors in our cells that can actually recognise when this situation is happening and it can overcome it. So it's part of a feedback loop. So this is actually a really important biological thing to be able to sense the stress in a membrane. So this is part of this, you know, this idea of asymmetry. We're always going to end up with a situation where one membrane might want to bend more than the other. So this is going to be energetically unfavourable and this is how we're going to get over it. So in the case of normal membranes, they will clamp shut to keep themselves flat. However, this is not something that is going to continue to happen. We can't keep adding type 2 lipids and hoping that the membrane can overcome this stress. Eventually, it will be more favourable for the membrane to bend and actually form a non-flat phase. So this is true synthetically, but it's also true biologically in the fact that some membranes are inherently not flat. If you look at a textbook uh, picture, of any of the membranes of things like the Golgi or the endoplasmic reticulum or a lysosome or things like that, they're not actually flat, so they have to be able to form a non-flat phase. So we have a bunch of different phases we can look at, and I've grouped them in terms of increasing negative curvature. So I've gone from flat, lamella, over here, through what we call the cubic phases, I'm going to go into these in a bit more detail, all the way to inverse hexagonal. And what I'm doing here is I'm increasing negative curvature. I'm increasing the bending towards the water. So I've gone from something that has no bending to something that is slightly bent towards the water to something that's actually gone all the way round and bent into this inverse micelle structure. So these non lamellar flat phases are really important because they allow the membrane to respond dynamically. And we can make these, again, synthetically. But they're important in things like fission, fusion, and endocytosis. All of these structures can occur. If you want information on how these can be measured, in terms of the types of technique we can measure to see whether they're occurring, this is actually what my group do. So do let me know afterwards if this is the sort of thing you're interested in. So, in order to bend a membrane, it's going to cost us something. It's going to require some energy. And that energy is going to be a function 
of the bending energy. So how much energy is it required to bend? How much energy is required in packing? And what's the electrostatic interactions? Now, for the purposes of simplicity, I'm going to set the electrostatic interactions to zero, because otherwise it gets really complicated. So, all I want you to think about here is taking a flat sheet and bending it. So it's the equivalent of taking this flat piece of paper, how much energy do I have to put in to make this piece of paper do this? Okay, that's all we're doing is we're taking a flat sheet and we're bending it like this. And all I want to know is how much energy is in the material, so how easy is the, the material to bend, and how much do I want to bend it by? So when you think about a piece of paper like this, if I start with it completely flat, the starting state is important. If it starts flat and I want to bend it like this, it's going to cost more energy than if it starts slightly curved and I want to bend it to the same point. So I need to think about what's the inherent bending within the sample and how much do I want to bend it and how easy is it going to be. So we can define some principal curvatures. So basically the principal curvatures are simply the radii, oops, excuse me, the radii of curvature here. So this is my sheet that I've bent. We will always have two radii of curvature, which we can define. And we can define two parameters, something called the mean curvature, which is the overall surface curvature, and something called the Gaussian curvature, which is the multiplier of the two principal curvatures. So if we add the two curvatures together, we get the mean curvature, so that's how overall curved the surface is. And if we multiply them together, we get the Gaussian curvature. And just for interest, if, you're ever, if this is something that you do find interesting, you can get something called uh, the Heilfrick equation, which actually puts this in terms of the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature, and it will tell you exactly how much energy goes into bending a membrane. Okay? And this, again, is something that we can calculate, and we can actually use to make predictions about the types of structural change that we can get in our systems. So here's some examples, and they've got biological relevance again. So a plain flat sheet will have the J value there, zero mean curvature, zero, zero, zero Gaussian curvature, because it's got no curvature at all. So its overall curvature is zero. A cylinder has got positive curvature in one direction, but zero curvature in the other. So if I add them together, I get a positive value. If I multiply them together, I get zero. Okay, so you can see that this has got positive mean curvature, but zero Gaussian curvature. A saddle surface where I have both positive and negative curvature, which is quite common, I get a positive and a negative, which when I add them together I get zero, but overall negative Gaussian curvature. And finally a sphere which is positively curved in all directions. So all I'm trying to do to get you to think about here is to take some kind of very biologically relevant structures and by applying very, very simple parameters to them we can make really powerful predictions about their structures. Now, this actually costs quite a lot of energy. So in biology, it will very often happen because of the lipids that we have in there, but also things like bar proteins. So bar proteins are these kind of banana-shaped proteins that will come along and bind to a membrane, and they'll pull the membrane into a curved configuration, and that lowers the energy cost of the membrane. There are some really nice calculations you can do about So you can actually make quite a lot of changes to curvature. Nanoparticles are also incredibly important in terms of the way they sit in the membrane. They can actually start to bend the membrane quite significantly. So we can affect the change in a membrane by adding something to it. So let's look at these phases in a little bit more detail. So the lamella phase is the flat one. It's the basic <coughs> structure that makes up a membrane. It's a one-dimensional stack of bilayers. Each bilayer here is separated by a region of water. And it's basically made up of these hydrophobic and hydrophilic groups back to back in this sort of bilayer structure. Now, laterally, so in the plane of the lipids, things can diffuse around. Okay, things can move, proteins can move, small molecules can move, and they move fairly quickly. So about 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 11 meters square per second. So they're moving around fairly fast. But the interchange between this layer and this layer is quite rare. It's very hard to get lipids to flip from the inside to the outside, and it only happens under certain circumstances. This is the quite a contentious area. Some people say it, it, it takes hours. Some people say it takes days. Um, there's been no kind of consensus on how to measure this properly. But you don't often get, apart from under certain circumstances, things going from the inside to the outside. And there's a nice 
transmission electron microgram kind of ordered structure. So let's go to the other end of the negative curvature spectrum, the inverse hexagonal phase. And this, uh, this is basically a set of silicates, so these contain water down here, and you can see them packing into this hexagonal lattice. So this is basically, if you go all the way to the end of the other side of negative curvature, we bend them all the way around here, and we pack them onto this lattice. This is followed by type 2 lipids, so like our phosphatidylethanolamine, and these are actually found in cellular systems in quite high concentrations. And one of the reasons for this is these seem to facilitate things like cell fusion. So if you've got two membranes coming together, the thought is that they probably go through an intermediate that looks not similar to this. Now, these are normally about 10 to 20 angstroms in diameter, and the overall packing kind of um, lattice parameter, so the distance between here is usually about 50 to 90 angstroms, depending on what liquids we've got in there. But we've got these um, uh, quite nice, kind of quite complex structures, and again, we can make these in the lab and we can study them. And you can see some of them again done a nice TEM image where you can see these beautiful hexagonal patterns. Uh, the inverse bicontinuous cubic phases, so these are very much what my group works on, these are sort of in between, and then I can show you some saddle structures. These are basically saddle surfaces. I have three types. I have the gyroid, I have the diamond, and I have the primitive. What I have here, it's really hard to visualise, is uh, a lipid bilayer draped across a surface such that I have interpenetrating water channels separated by a layer of liquid. Now they're very beautiful and they're very complex and they don't look biologically relevant at all, but actually we find them all the way through the biological kingdom. So they're a single continuous bilayer dividing the space into two interlinked but separate subvolumes of water. So that's these white water channels here. And they're based on these primitive diamond and symmetries. If you're interested in membrane proteins, these are highly used in membrane protein crystallization. And they're ubiquitous across biology. You find them in the uh, membranes of amoeba. When, if you stress an amoeba, I don't know how you stress an amoeba, but you can apparently. If you stress an amoeba, its membranes will flip in its mitochondria to give you a primitive cubic phase because it increases surface area and it allows more ATP production. So you actually do see these in biology. Uh, butterfly wings, um, the reason for the colour in a butterfly wing is very often due to the gyroidal packing. So they're across length scales. You see them in the spines of sea urchins. They confer mechanical stability. So all the way from the nano scale to the micro scale, we see these cubic phase structures. So there's something biologically very important about them. But how are we going to actually cross the membrane? I've said it's a hydrophobic core, and it's designed to keep stuff out. Okay, the idea is that the cell doesn't want anything to just be able to get in. So how are we going to get something in? So there's two major ways. There's passive transport, and there's active transport. We're going to start with passive transport. The definition of passive transport is that molecules can cross a membrane with no energy being expended. So it does not require the use of things like ATP. It requires no driving force. And so this is basically the process of diffusion and facilitated diffusion. So diffusion is basically requires no energy for these molecules to move across the membrane. So it looks something like this. I have a bilayer and I have a molecule that's basically going to just traverse across the membrane. Now the key to diffusion is I'm going from a high concentration to a low concentration. So I'm going with the concentration gradient. So this not requiring any energy to be expended only works if I'm going with the concentration gradient. Okay, So I'm going from high to low. And eventually I'll end up with the same concentration on both sides and then I won't get any further diffusion. So this can happen either on its own, it can happen through a channel, or it can happen through some sort of gated cap. But in all cases, it doesn't require the input of energy. It just happens, but only with the concentration gradient. So we can describe this by fixed law of diffusion. And again, it's a very simple relationship that just tells me the diffusion coefficient of the drug or the molecule in the membrane, so how fast it's going to go through. The partition coefficient, so how likely is it to get stuck in the membrane. Okay. If it's going to get stuck in the membrane, it's not going to diffuse. So we want something that isn't going to partition into the membrane. The membrane thickness, so how far does it have to move? And the difference in the concentration on the inside to the outside, so what's the concentration gradient? If that value of P, the partition coefficient, is very high, the drug or the molecule or the nanoparticle may just get stuck. Now this is a problem 
that it can't leave, and you've got a drug that keeps getting stuck in the membrane, you're going to end up with a very high local concentration. And that might have some very unwanted side effects. So measuring the partitioning is something that drug and biomedical companies actually spend a lot of time doing because they want to know exactly how likely their drug is to get through the membrane. And the simplest way to do it, and it is a way that is still done in a lot of companies, is by measuring something called log P, which is the partition function, and you literally take your drug in a mixture of water and one octanol. Now, octanol is a fairly hydrophobic solvent, and so it's a model for the membrane. You put your drug in, you shake it up, and you see how much goes to the water and how much goes to the octanol, and that tells you the partition coefficient. It's not the most accurate, and people have now moved on to things like surface plasmon resonance as a better technique for doing this. But it is actually, to a first approximation, a very good way of telling you whether your molecule or nanoparticle or material would prefer to be in the lipid layer or prefer to be in the water layer. And you can measure it with things like UVBs, or you can put radio traces on, or you can do it with HPLC. And you can make it a bit more sophisticated by taking into account things like the pH and the charge, and that gives you something called a distribution function. If you ever want to know whether your material is going to go across the membrane, that's the simplest way of figuring it out. So we've done passive transport, what about active transport? Now this does need energy, so this is going to require energy in the form of ATP. There's something called primary active transport, this is the direct use of ATP, or the secondary active transport, where there is a gradient set up by a second molecule which drives the movement of the molecule you're interested in. It's also the reason that we have drug resistance. So active transport looks something like this. So I have a lipid bilayer, and I'm moving against my concentration gradient now. So I can take a molecule from low concentration to high concentration because I'm putting in energy. I'm driving the molecule across the membrane. So it can go in a very simple manner. It can just be driven through a channel by something called uniport, where a single molecule goes through a single channel. It can be driven set up by a second molecule, and both molecules can go in the same direction across the membrane, and if they do that, we call it simple. Or I can have a molecule coming out of the membrane, and that gradient is driving another molecule to go into the membrane, and in that case, I end up with something called antiport. But in all cases, I need some energy, so I need to turn over some ATP, but also I can move molecules against this concentration gradient. So this is how a lot of cell surface receptors will do things, so this is how things are brought into the cell in many cases. Now, the problem with this is it actually leads to drug resistance. So ABC transporters, so these are ATP binding cassette transporter proteins. These are one of the main classes of membrane protein that actually are able to pull things into the cell. Now, in cancer, you get P-glycoprotein and multi-drug resistant proteins overexpressing on the surface. So let's say you kill a bunch of cells off due to chemotherapy. The ones that have evolved to have this overexpression of these proteins on the surface are the ones that are going to carry on surviving, and they're going to carry on dividing. So you end up with a situation whereby the cell recognises the chemotherapeutic agent and is able to kick it straight back out again. So it can bring it in, realise it doesn't want it, and send it straight back out. And of course, the cells that can't do that die, but the cells that can do that are the ones that survive. And so you end up with a resistance to chemotherapy. And this is unfortunately quite common in leukaemia. And the same has happened in malaria, that uh, the mosquito that um, uh, has now evolved to recognise chloroquine, which was the main drug that treated malaria, due to an overexpression of ABC transporters that were able to actually kick the chloroquine out of um, the parasite. And so we have a system here whereby we always have to think about, well, what are we going to do to overcome this drug resistance? Any kind of nanomaterial or any kind of drug delivery vector, we have to think about how is the cell going to evolve to respond to what we're giving it. We also have something called secondary multi-drug transport, where bacteria are very good at coupling transport with the export of protons. So they set up a pH gradient, and they're able to kick uh, antibiotics out of the cell, leading to what is probably going to be one of the biggest health crises that we're going to see in the next 50 years, which is the development of ubiquitous antibiotic resistance, unless we do something now. Okay? So this is going to be really, really important. Bacteria are immensely clever, and they also evolve incredibly quickly. And so this is a really big problem. So how do we measure all of this? Um, there's classical approaches that we can do, so some very standard kind of chemistry and biochemistry we can do. 
So we can use using this spectroscopy, FTIR, circular dichroism spectroscopy, fluorescence spectroscopy, we can label things and look at their transport. We can look at calorimetry, so we can measure things like the differential scanning calorimetry profile, which tells us about how the drugs are interacting with the membrane. We can use small angle X-ray scattering, so that's my technique, that along with uh, neutron scattering that I use. Um, if you're interested in small angle X-ray scattering, please come talk to me. Um, we can look at NMR, uh, and we can use HPLC. It's all very classical approaches, will tell us a lot. We can also use some in vivo techniques, so we can use positron emission tomography, uh, which tells us about the distribution of a drug within a tissue. This is a very useful technique to see where your drug is going. And you can also use autoradiography as well, which again, if you label your drug with a radio tracer, you can see exactly which part of the tissue it's going to. Uh, I know it's an old paper, but I couldn't help pimping one of my own papers, which is I wrote a review in 2009 uh, for the Chemistry Society Reviews on drug interactions with lipid membranes, where I've gone into quite a lot of detail about how each of these techniques works in terms of the types of measurements you can get out. If you're interested, please do come and talk to me about it, particularly about SAPs. So, in the final few minutes, I want to take everything that we've sort of learnt about self-assembly, about the different kind of structures, and think about how we can not only think of these as a membrane material, but use them as a nanomaterial. And so, we can actually take lipids and we can, depending on the packing parameter and depending on the types of lipids we have, we've got access to a huge number of different structures. Okay, we can make a huge number of different structures which we might be able to think about using as some sort of uh, biomaterial. So we can have this range of structures from micelles, hexagonal phases, inverse hexagonal phases, and these kind of nice little sort of artificial cell-like structures called the liposome. And so the liposome is a natural consequence of taking a flat bilayer structure where you've got edges which are exposed to water, they're going to want to come together and they're going to want to form this kind of bag that's a bit like a cell. And so these are actually one of the really kind of uh, useful tools, both in sort of biophysics, but also in thinking about drug delivery. So vesicles and liposomes can basically occur from when you take uh, a flat bilayer, it's going to become a spherical bilayer in order to get rid of the edges. Okay, if you think about not wanting to expose the edges of the lipids to water, this is a really bad idea, having it like this. So being able to close this up into an enclosed space gives us something that we can actually get rid of this kind of um, increase in energy because we've got the tails exposed to water, but also it gives us something with an aqueous interior that can be sat in an aqueous exterior like our cell. It also leads to a structure with a finite number of lipids, so that's entropically very favoured. So if you take a bilayer and leave it, eventually you can close up and make a liposome. And we think these liposomes or vesicles, they're kind of very interchangeable terms, could actually be the prototype for the earliest kind of cell. A simple membrane that contains things like DNA and RNA on the inside, which actually, with a few amino acids and a bit of ATP, may have led to the development of what we now understand as cells. And there's quite a lot of work in Bristol University going on on trying to make models of these. The bilayer needs the curve for vesicle to form, so basically we have a p-value of slightly less than 1. So in reality, um, if you've got a p-value that's anywhere between like, about 0.8 and 1, you'll generally be all right and this will form, and you'll get a nice stable liposome structure. These are quite easy to make. So we'll see that later. So there's the smallest vesicle radius that the lipids can adopt whilst maintaining their preferred value of the cross-sectional head group area. And we can approximate that, again, just using the length, the volume, and the head group area. And we can work out the number of lipids per vesicle. Now, this might seem a bit boring and a bit arcane, but actually, if you're going to use this as a drug delivery vector, you need to know how many lipids you've got to how many drug molecules you've got. So you need to know how many lipids are in your structure. In terms of working out concentrations, you're going to make a concentration of liposomes. You need to know how many liposomes you've got. Otherwise, you can't kind of you, you can't calibrate for, for what your concentration is. So being able to figure out what your concentration of lipids is is really really important. Now these are already in use in chemotherapy. So these liposome structures have already found commercial use in chemotherapy. They're quite simple uses, but they've actually been very very effective. And in order to think about why this is the case, we need to think about what we need from a nanoscale drug delivery vector. 
We want improved pharmacokinetics. We'd like the drug to work on a kinetic profile that actually works for us. We'd like it to, to work as quickly as we need it to work it and last as long as we would like it to last. We'd love the release from our drug delivery vector to be controlled. We don't just want to put it in the body and the whole thing kind of gives out the drug in one go. We'd like that re uh, release to be controlled over a time scale that we define. We'd like it to be targeted. So we'd like it to go to the tissue or the tumour of choice and not interact with the healthy cells unless we can absolutely avoid it. So one of the big drawbacks of chemotherapy is it does tend to target healthy tissue as well as diseased tissue, and that's what leads to side effects. So we can have something that by design targets a particular cell type or a particular tissue type, then we're going to reduce side effects and improve efficacy. And we'd also like it to be non-toxic, so we have to think about how it will be broken down and excreted from the body. How will it be metabolised? You can design the best nanoscale drug delivery vector in the world, but if it kills the patient because it's actually toxic, nobody's going to buy it. So we need to think about all of these things. And actually, lipids are pretty good because, you know, they're already non-toxic. They're in your body. Their breakdown products are non-toxic because you've got them in your body. And they shouldn't be too aggressive on the body because the body already recognises them as being biologically compatible. So you can imagine what this might look like. Liposome to give you a lot of flexibility. You've got this interior volume here where you can put something hydrophilic. Okay, so you can stick something hydrophilic in the centre to get a water-soluble drug. Unfortunately, a lot of drugs aren't water-soluble, so you need to be able to put them in something that's more oily, more fatty. Well, brilliant, we've got a membrane, and that membrane has a hydrophobic core, and we can therefore put the more hydrophobic drugs into the membrane. So we have the ability to tune the liposome on the basis of what our drug looks like. We can also modify the surface of the membrane, so we can put things on the surface. You can imagine this could be done for targeting, so we could target specific receptors. So we have a very flexible modular system that we can use. We can make them from about 50 nanometers in diameter all the way up to about a micron in diameter quite easily, and we can tailor the lipid composition. So we can tailor it with different charges, different curvature elastic stresses, different compositions, so we have a system here that can be very much designed to our liking. Now, we can make liposomes in a number of different ways. The easiest way of doing it is taking a bunch of lipids in water and sonicating them in a sonic bath. This is great, it takes about 30 minutes to get a really good dispersion of lipids. The problem is that it will give you very small lip, uh, liposomes, about 20 to 30 nanometers, and very big ones. Okay, so there's no control over size. If you want to load those with a drug, you've got no control over concentration and loading. So sonication is easy, but it isn't very effective in terms of control. You can do something called extrusion. So I've shown you an extruder on the uh, right-hand side over there. An extruder basically takes your solution of lipids and it forces it through a polycarbonate membrane, which has got holes in it of the diameter that you want your lipid, uh, liposome to be, <coughs> so between 50, 100, 200 nanometers. You force it through five or six times and you actually end up with a really nice monodispersed suspension of your liposomes. This is really straightforward, it's easily done in the lab. I've actually got a little hand extruder which is just two syringes that you can do the same thing with. So it's a nice simple way of making them and very controllable. You can do something called electroformation where you can make a flat layer of lipids and then very gently hydrate them and then allow them to form a liposome on their own. This gives you much bigger liposomes, what we call giant liposomes. So these are around a micron up to 10 microns. And the nice thing about these is, you can see here in this confocal microscopy image, they can be fluorescently labelled and we can actually image a single liposome. What you're looking at here is phase separation in a liposome between two lipids that would rather be bonded to themselves. And so laterally they've separated into two regimes. And finally, more recently, microfluidics has become a really good and effective way of generating high throughput, large quantities of lipids in a very, very kind of straightforward manner. You can also make structured drug delivery vectors. So all of those different phases that I told you about, uh, the hexagonal phase and the cubic phases, it's possible to turn those into a nanoparticle and stabilise the edges and actually make a drug delivery liposome that has internal structure. So what you have here is, uh, this is done by a colleague of mine, Charlotte Conn, who's at um, RMIT in Melbourne, 
She's taken a lipid that forms the cubic phase and she's been able to make a structured nanoparticle with a cubic interior. Here she's made a hexagonal nanoparticle with a hexagonal interior. And you can see how well the lipids pack around the edges that you get these hexagonal soft nanoparticles. And then finally, these are kind of disordered sponge nanoparticles where you've got something that's a bit like a cubic phase, but it's a little bit more disordered. So actually, the liposome doesn't have to just be an empty bag. It can have internal structure as well, which makes them, again, incredibly useful. Now, how does the body deal with all of this? You've got to degrade or metabolize this into non-toxic components in order for them to clear your body. If anything is below 30 nanometers, it's cleared by renal excretion, so it's basically passed out through the kidneys. Anything greater than 30 nanometers is cleared by something called the mononuclear phagocytic system, or the MPS, which is basically the macrophages in your liver and your spleen will come and they will break down uh, any sort of drug delivery factor they come across. But the take up by the macrophages is going to be depending on the opsonization process in the immune system. So, opsonins uh, bind to foreign materials and they're things like IgG and IgA proteins. Now, what you want is the drug delivery factor to hang out, hang around long enough to do its job, but then to be broken down. If it's immediately caught by the macrophages and broken down, it's no use. But if it hangs around and it's never broken down, that's also not very good either. So you want to find a way of modifying your, your liposome structure and be broken down the right time scale. And if you put polyethylene glycol on the surface, so if you functionalize the surface of polyethylene glycol, you find you can evade opsonization for long enough that generally you can get the drug to its target. So there's some examples of therapeutic uses of lymphocytes. And they can be pegylated, they can be the right size, so they can be cleared, they can be targeted, so they're quite useful. So in current usage, uh, doxyl is a liposome formation of a very common cancer drug called doxorubicin. And it's actually used as a treatment for cancer in uh, age-related carpotis sarcoma and multiple myeloma. And so it's been shown to be mu much more effective than doxyl on its own. It's more efficacious, so it works better. It's less toxic, and it turns out that the liposome coating allows the leukemia cells to somehow take the drug in and metabolize it better and kill them quicker. And so it's become a very effective treatment. The other really interesting use of liposomes, and the one that I think is, is potentially within all kind of nanoscale drug delivery factors, is the time to market to make a new drug is huge, okay? And it's an incredibly expensive process. A lot of the times we need new drugs because the old ones are ineffective because We've developed resistance to them. But if you can package a drug up into something where the body doesn't recognize that it's got a resistance to it, you can use a drug that's already been tested in a formulation that allows you to get that drug to where it needs to be and then kind of launch a surprise attack once the liposome bursts open and the drug appears. And that's exactly what's happened in um, a treatment for colon cancer. <coughs> So it's been shown that if you put doxorubicin in a liposome and you use it to treat colon cancer, it's only been done in mouse models so far, these C26 cells are resistant to doxorubicin, but if you put the doxorubicin in a liposome, it's effective in killing the cancer cells. So rather than go to the trouble of developing a whole new drug, what you can do is you can use a clever nanocarrier to evade this kind of resistance process and get the drug that originally worked into the cell before the cell knows what's happening. And then you're not spending the time and money on testing an entirely new therapy. You're repurposing an older one, which I think is a really cool idea. Now there are some drawbacks. The, per the first is that preparing liposomes generally involves um, organic solvents. And so it's very hard to make sure that you get rid of all of the organic solvent, which of course is going to be a problem. You don't want to be introducing organic solvents into the body. So to be able to prepare the kind of films of liposomes and to be able to mix the lipids together, it does require mm. things like chlorophyll. And so this is not great uh, for an industrial process. It's never going to be universally applicable. You can't make a single liposome carrier that's going to treat every single type of disease. And so there's a lot of work that has to go into tailoring every single liposome for the right, um, for the right purpose. It's pretty hard to scale up. Um, so it's not a process that works on an industrial scale very well. And it's also quite hard to make it reproducible. And again, for drug delivery, reproducibility is critical because you want to make sure every batch of your formulation is identical so people know what they're getting. 
And when we say we can control targeting, we can't really. We can kind of do it to a degree, but nowhere near as effectively as we would like to be able to do it. So working on what we put on the outside to be able to target a specific cell is really important. Um, we can control the parameters of the liposomes fairly well, but there's still a huge amount of work that needs to be done on truly understanding this. And also the, con the control of the release, the, the kinetics of the release profile. We think we know a lot about it, but again, to be able to target every single kind of illness that we might want to, every kind of tissue, the release is going to be slightly different. So each system has got to be worked on individually, so it's a lot of work. So that brings me pretty much to the end of uh, what I wanted to talk about. Um, my brief summary is that amplifiers such as lipids, please remember these are only an example of one particular type of amplifier. There are lots of different types in the literature, but everything I've shown you hopefully is applicable to all of them. We can make different self-assemble structures that have a materials relevance in the nanotechnology field, but they also have a biological relevance. And for me, that's the interesting bit. It's where those two cross over. And that the lipids themselves are the effective barrier between influx and efflux in the cell, and without them we wouldn't have cells. Mm. Self-assembly behaviour is governed by shape and curvature properties, and it's also governed by this idea of the minimum free energy of a system. If we get that right, we can form a really rich variety of shapes, and we can also study how different structures will interact with the cell membrane and how it might impact on the cell membrane's shape and curvature, and that we can use that self-assembly property and exploit it in terms <coughs> of making liposomes for chemotherapy, which are going to be really useful if we want to repurpose existing drugs, but we also have to remember that this is not a universal solution and that there are still plenty of drawbacks and still plenty of things to work on. And I hope that that's something that some of you might be able to figure out in the future. I'm really happy to take any questions, either now or um, later on, and thank you very much for your attention. Liposomes, mm. and I was curious what for or why did they make them? Why did they make them? That's a really good question. So, one of the reasons that, that people are looking at not just the hexagonal liposomes but also the cubic liposomes as well is if you think about it, you've got this kind of 100 nanometer structure. On the inside, you've got this interior that has this structured bilayer. Now, let's say your drug is hydrophobic and you want it to be in a bilayer. If you can create an internal bilayer structure, you can load loads of that drug inside uh, a hexagonal or a, a cubic liposome. If you've just got one membrane around the outside and then an empty interior, you can only load drug into that outside membrane. Mm -hmm. So for things like very hydrophobic drugs, this internal membrane structure actually really helps in terms of loading a much higher level of drug. Mm -hmm. The second thing is about the release. So, um, if you've just again got a kind of uh, a liposome with an interior, once that bursts, once that degrades, everything comes out. Where with the cubic phase ones, you've got the water channels. And what you find is, is as the exterior degrades, some will, well, some will leak out, mm -hmm. then it starts to break down gradually and more will leak out. So you get a much smoother release profile. Mm -hmm. So people have shown that you can control the kinetics of the breakdown uh, much better and there's actually a difference even between hexagonal and cubic. Think about the hexagonal. You've got these kind of water channels, these tubes. So effectively, everything's going in one direction. So it's a bit quicker where with the cubic phases, you've got lots of twists and turns for the drug to get through. Mm -hmm. So you can modify the release profile by modifying the internal structure, which is quite nice. Mm -hmm. And I have a question, second question yeah, sure. as well. Um, you mentioned that cells uh, produce uh, CCT proteins yeah. that actually stabilize the membrane, yeah. uh, whatever it feels tension. Yeah. So I'm curious if there are any research about knockout of, these, of the gene that produces this protein and see if cells survive or not. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I can definitely point you to some of the original CCT papers where they did the biophysics experiments. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things is when CCT doesn't work properly, so when CCT doesn't switch off, 
So what you end up with is a condition called phospholipidosis. Because effectively what happens is, is the mechanism to start making more lipids never turns off. And so instead of just having a membrane around the outside, you keep depositing membranes. And one thing that the group I used to work in showed was that certain drugs can actually switch on an uncontrollable lipid synthesis pathway. So if you take, for example, antipsychotics for a very long period of time, you find that they find at autopsy, the brains of patients who've been taking antipsychotics for a long time will actually have loads and loads of membranes laid down because the antipsychotics seem to interfere with the natural switch off of the lipid synthesis. And mm -hmm. so it, it's a kind of a side effect that nobody really predicted that only became obvious when somebody did the biophysical experiment. Mm -hmm. but in terms of CCT knockouts, I don't know, but it would be an interesting thing to look at. I would be surprised. I imagine it would be fairly catastrophic to cell survival if you can't, because eventually your membrane would just keep getting tenser and tenser, and then it would break. Mm -hmm. It could be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you can measure the interaction of the membrane mm -hmm. with a drug, for example, yeah. uh, using hash pills. HPLC, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how can it be done? Because I know you can measure, you can identify the drug or the concentration of HPLC, but how can you measure the interaction? That's a great question. So using yeah. HPLC, what you can do is, if, let's say you've got um, you know, a solution of drug and then your solution of, of liposomes, for example, and you mix them together, the retention time down the column will be different from the free drug, with the free drug, from the bound drug. And so you basically will get two populations on your HPLC you'll be able to then quantify how much is binding. People also do things like you can um, use nickel columns, nickel affinity columns, where you can have a lipid that binds specifically to a nickel column. So you catch all of the liposomes that have on the nickel column and elute all the free drug, and then you look at how much drug is left in the liposomes. So it's a simple retention time thing, because the liposomes are obviously like 100 nanometers, so they're going to run very differently in an HPLC to a, to a free drug. Um, I have a question regarding the images that you show. Yeah. Which technique do you use to... Which particular ones? No, I mean uh, oh, the hexagonal shape or any so, other shapes, like so what microscopy Yeah, the, the images are done by... Uh, so the images of the, the, the different uh, structures were done by electron microscopy. So it's transmission cryo electron microscopy. Okay. You have to do cryo because imagine these things are in water and so you have to flash freeze them to maintain the structure. It's difficult, but it is doable. As you'll see from the quality of the pictures you can get out, they are actually very yeah. good. Um, it's, not a, it's not a straightforward thing to do, but it can be done. But what we do in our lab is we use small angle x-ray scattering. And what we do is we get a scattering pattern from which we can infer the structure. So very often, because I can't afford access to our cryo EM facility, it's like a thousand pounds a day, so I just kind of not doing that so I do the scattering experiments because that from that I can use the pattern to reconstruct an image but that's quite destructive right no SACs can be done without being destructive so I can do it and recover the sample afterwards so it, on an in-house beam line like we have um, the x-rays are such low energy that actually okay. so we've got a low flux compared to say a big synchrotron facility so yeah take them to a synchrotron a one second exposure and my sample I'll get a scattering pattern, but the sample's not much use after that. My lab, um, the flux that I have, I can easily in five, ten minutes get a really nice scattering pattern from a lipid, um, and the sample will be perfectly usable after that. Okay. Because because we're not working with really, really high energies. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, come on. Yeah. Uh, what are the source of uh, the lipids that you use uh, for liposome lipo formation? What's the source of the lipids? So we we buy ours. Um, we buy them from a company called um, Avanti, who are the world's biggest supplier of lipids. Uh, I don't work for them, by the way. It's just that they happen to be very good. Oh, but they're animal, vegetal, human. They are. Depend uh, now. That depends. So you can get depending on what you want to do. You can get them from different sources. Okay. So you can buy plant lipids. You can, um, so some of our lipids are plant lipids. All of the cubic phase stuff that, that you, you've seen, that's all from um, plant lipids. Okay, plant lipids happen to form cubic phases much easier. The lipids we get to do our liposomes, we use synthetic lipids, so they're just synthesized. 
One of the very common sources of getting phosphocholines is egg yolks. So you can get egg yolk PCs. Now they're, they're, they're not homogeneous, but they make a very good liposome. So you can buy them quite cheaply. Most of them will either be synthetic or from mammalian sources or from E. coli. So you can buy E. coli lipids. So as model systems, you either buy a single synthetic or a mixed, usually egg one, or usually a mixed E. coli one. They're the, they're the model ones. But actually, by buying individual ones, you can make your own kind of formulations, which is what we do a lot of. Uh, another question. Yeah. Uh, we try to use uh, uh, human cells, unplated cells, for example, blood cells or platelets to uh, as drug delivery? Um, so I have seen people using things like ghost erythrocytes, so basically where you take an erythrocyte and take everything out of it and just leave the membrane. Um, so people do try and do that. I think there's a possible problem around compatibility, so this is going slightly outside my area. We tend to stick to the more kind of synthetic ones because we can control it better. Everybody just wants lunch now, don't they? <laughs> I think we can continue yeah. our discussion during the lunch time. Yeah, sure. Which is Brilliant. the, the Thank you. same. Thank you very much. Thank you.